going to follow uh, my presentation. We'll talk about the specific treatments uh, in obesity management, while I will provide an overarching and general approach to obesity management. Let's start with three scenarios here. The first lady is Ms. Triple A. She's 30 years old. She has a BMI of 30. Uh, but she's been referred to you not for the BMI or for obesity, but actually for young hypertension, for which we've done workup and ruled out secondary causes. You also note that she has irregular periods and impaired fasting glucose just detected recently, just reported recently. However, she's not been told that her weight was medically related to her current health problem. Second gentleman is also 30 years old with a BMI 30. A recent screening showed he has no obesity-related health issues. He's tried multiple diets in the past, but usually he only lasts for a month and he would give up. But he's here now to ask you for weight loss medication. The third lady, 30 years old and married with one child, BMI of 30 as well. She had GDM with her first pregnancy. And now in the recent health screening, she's been found to have a high blood sugars of 6.6, a HbA1c of 6.8%. Now, she has tried all sorts of diet, including over-the-counter Olestat, with good success. However, she would regain weight after stopping all these uh, interventions. Now, she's here because she's very serious about getting medical help, as she wants to normalize her sugar, reverse her diabetes, before trying to have another child. So, these three patients have similar BMI. Um, do we then, you know, give them the same advice because they're obesity? Um, where do we start? What are the clinical considerations? So I hope to be able to impart some understanding to you on the rationale and general approach to obesity as a chronic disease in particular, explore the approach uh, to the management of obesity, regardless of the type of interventions that we're going to use. So in my last presentation, we touched on the concept of obesity as a chronic disease. Now, what does that mean for chronic disease? It implies that the disease uh, will not go away in a matter of months or years. And if you leave it alone, it's going to progress. And even if you treat it successfully, there's a higher tendency for it to come back. It also implies that the etiology and the factors that are causing the disease have started before the manifestation of the disease or as the disease is developing. And also that if we leave this condition or disease untreated, there's a very high likelihood of the person with the condition to develop complications. So approaching obesity as a disease, why is there a need, we ask ourselves first. So we need to look at it from the angle of people with obesity. These are the people for whom we are designing obesity care and the reason why we're here to learn about obesity. So in Singapore, we did a survey on 107 people with a, who attended this public forum on obesity, most of whom were women, and actually all of them have overweight of obesity, with 75% of them having obesity. Yet, all of them had misperceptions of their weight. They thought they were lighter than they were, and even some thinking they were of normal weight, despite all having overweight and obesity. When we asked about their specific attitudes towards obesity management, large majority of them felt it was completely their responsibility to lose weight and that just using healthy diet and exercise, everyone should be able to achieve a healthy weight. And when we looked at the bottom about weight loss medications, actually a lot of them, a majority of them felt weight loss medications are dangerous and large mass majority of them felt that weight loss medications were ineffective despite them being proven to be effective. Then when we you know, sort of did a very similar study around our region in South and Southeast Asia, uh, looking at a perception of obesity and attitudes. Vietnam is a part of this study called Action APEC, in which we interviewed, surveyed 10,000 people with obesity and nearly 2,000 healthcare professionals. And you can see that majority of people interviewed or surveyed, sorry, uh, felt that obesity was a chronic disease, even though one third of people with obesity didn't think it was an a medical issue or a chronic disease. But what's also quite frightening is that, you know, quite a substantial of people with obesity were not told they had obesity. And about one quarter of doctors uh, who treated obesity did not tell the patients or counsel the patients that they had obesity. 
And when we ask about very specific treatments, for example, in this case, weight loss medications, most of people, the BC and also healthcare professionals said, you know, they'd rather people just lose weight on their own, basically lifestyle therapy, some diet before prescribing medications to them. And they're very concerned about side effects and long-term safety of these medications. And also what's actually quite surprising, actually, most of them, including healthcare professionals, did not think that weight loss medications were more effective than other treatment options. And this is despite us already having a lot of data showing uh, the effects you know, uh, and safety of weight loss medications uh, and them being more efficacious than just lifestyle therapy. Now, when we look at surgery, again, very starking. Um, actually, more starking is healthcare professionals not really referring patients for surgery because they just want them to lose weight on their own. And obviously, there's some concerns about safety. You can understand that. But look at the bottom there. You know, majority of doctors and people with obesity did not think that weight loss surgery was more effective than other treatment options, despite it being proven so uh, over the last you know, 30 to 50 years and with data on that. So all these surveys really points towards a, a huge discordance and gap towards what people think uh, obesity is, say they think it's a chronic disease, and how they truly behave. They still think this is all a lifestyle issue, um, it's a personal issue, it's really not a medical issue, and they don't quite either not know the science or believe in the science that's out there. So we got to ask ourselves too, if we regard obesity as a chronic disease, do we approach it in the same way as with patients with other chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Ask ourselves as healthcare professionals and doctors, do we withhold informing patients that they have type 2 diabetes or hypertension? Or, or, and do we delay treatment in them, whether it's lifestyle treatment or medical treatment? Would we view approved treatments like antihypertensive, glucose-lowering medications, as unsafe and ineffective despite them already being approved and shown to be safe? Do we use these treatments then only for short term because they've achieved the targets of care? We don't, right? In type 2 diabetes hypertension, we may adjust the medications, but we don't stop asking patients to not you know, have high refined carbs or stop exercising because they've attained a good sugar or stop their metformin, et cetera, or antihypertensive medication. In the same way, patients, if they really had type 2 diabetes and hypertension, they won't rely solely on non-healthcare advice like the internet to manage their disease or delay consulting a doctor or felt that, you know, this medical thing is completely my responsibility. They would quickly go and seek help from doctors by and large. But this is not the case with obesity. So when we, you know, start to educate people and discuss obesity and regard it as a chronic disease, we will then correct the misconceptions of obesity, not just in people with obesity, but among ourselves as healthcare professionals. We will re we rethink our approach to obesity as a systemic disease, addressing the multifactorial pathophysiology. We will stop blaming patients for having the condition. We don't blame patients for having heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, or cancer. Right? We will just you know, focus it as a disease and just treat it, collaborate with patients to give them the best therapy. And also then we can also start prioritizing obesity medical education, not just in healthcare professionals, but early on in medical school, nursing school, et cetera, just like how we are doing now um, to, to, to really talk about the science of obesity. Now, this is the type 2 diabetes management uh, consensus released this year by ADA and EASD. And you can see that uh, the goals of care in patients with type 2 diabetes or, or chronic disease is to prevent the complication and optimize the quality of care. It's not so much about the actual sugar level uh, that we're trying to attain. And when we look at the first layer of care, guiding the principles of care in patients with type 2 diabetes, it's not about the specifics of treatment, what drug to use, but the psychosocial factors, looking at the social determinants of health, looking at the patient factors, the motivators, the support that they have, the concerns that they have, risk stratify them, and then go into the specifics of, in this case, glycemic management, looking at the driver, uh, the, the, the biggest driver of type 2 diabetes in most people, which is weight. And then the thing that really so called uh, kills our patients is the cardiovascular uh, disease, cardiovenal, and then looking at how we can risk stratify and risk modify, reduce that complication. 
So in the very same way, our, our approach to a patient uh, with obesity should be like this. Uh, we have to assess individually the impact of obesity on the health in general, but assessing the severity and stage of obesity. We will assess their lifestyle in so doing, the trends of the way. And in that case, we can tease out the root causes and the drivers that are influencing their behaviours uh, that cause the weight gain. And along the way, we can assess the motivations uh, for the weight loss and the barriers, looking through how in the past, what has worked and what has not, to, to readdress uh, these above issues. Now, I've had patients that say, doc, this method has worked. But, you know, I just didn't have time. I had something cropped up. I had a busy work project. I had to stop, you know, that intervention. But I don't mind trying it again. Or you have patients saying, I've tried that. I know that gave me horrible side effects. I do not want to go in it. And sometimes we can discuss why that was so, right? And in so doing, we then individualize the treatment goals and therapies to each patient. And with the goal of treatment, not being BMI-centric, but now being person-centric, there's a complication-centric, a disease-centric. By BMI-centric, it means that any, everybody and any everybody who hits that BMI criteria will then go on therapy and will just give a 5 to 10% weight loss goal to everybody. Now, there's going to be low benefit risk ratio there and also perhaps low cost effectiveness. Whereas for complications, we will then assess the risk of, the, of developing the presence and the severity of this obesity-related complications, and then decide treatment indications and types of treatment uh, for the patient. And the goal of treatment is to treat these complications in the patients, being more aggressive in those who really can derive the highest benefit, and then perhaps infer high cost effectiveness in them. Now, we need to also obviously assess that the patient has excess adiposity and abnormal adiposity. Now, in Vietnam, your BMI class 1 will start from 25 and class 2 will start from 30. But don't forget to measure the waist circumference as we Asians have a very high propensity for visceral or ectopic uh, adiposity that's driving the disease. And then we will then examine using uh, staging systems like the Edmonton Obesity Staging System to see how much the this excess adiposity has impacted the patient's health. Looking at four factors here, metabolic risk, physical symptoms, for example, joint pains, psychological factors, or functional limitations. And if the patient's not affected at all, we will then say, you know, you're stage zero regardless of your class of BMI. However, in a patient who is quite severely affected by obesity, for example, and organ damage, heart failure, diabetes complications, or we're so affected psychologically, they're so depressed, they can't get out of the house, therefore affecting them functionally, or severe you know, knee pains and joint pains, they can't get out of bed, severe OSA where they can't breathe, et cetera. These are very severe stages, regardless of the BMI, but obviously they have to have a high BMI. Then how this uh, staging system helps us is that these patients in lower stages may not necessarily need to lose weight now, we can just start things like diet therapy, maybe just maintain the weight. But if they want to lose the weight, yes, we, we can go ahead and help them lose the weight, examine the lifestyle factors and lose lifestyle therapy and lose about 5% of the weight. But in patients stage three and stage four, we need to sort of urgently lose weight, uh, help them lose weight, even using pharmacotherapy or bariatric surgery in these patients. Um, needing more urgent care, tertiary specialist care in that sense. Now, what's also significant about EOSS is regardless of BMI, the more severe stages of um, this score will actually predict mortality in these patients and hence the urgency to treat. Another system that is commonly used is the ACE, the AACEE or ACE obesity guidelines, looking again at the presence of obesity-related complications if there are none. Um, in fact, they call it adiposity-related complications because even patients in overweight, uh, these come into play. And if they have none complications, uh, we can just advise some lifestyle therapy. And of course, if they are, uh, meet a BMI criteria and they do not achieve the weight loss or continue to weight, gain their weight despite lifestyle therapy, we can consider weight loss medications. But the goal of treatment here is to prevent the development of any of these obesity-related complications. We have to continually still monitoring them uh, for these complications. But in patients who do develop um, these obesity-related complications, we need to then assess the severity of it 
if it's mild to moderate, similar as what we talked about, but if it's more severe, we can consider starting concurrent um, at anti obesity medication or even consider bariatric surgery in this case. Now, the treatment goals here is to manage and control these obesity related complications, such as you know, uh, hard to control type 2 diabetes, the OSA, the severe knee pains, et cetera, to delay the progression of complications and hopefully to prevent other complications from developing. The third score that's commonly used is the King's criteria, looking at nine domains from A to A to I, and then staging them and deciding the therapy. Now, again, it's not a one size fits all weight loss. The goal of treatment and what we want to treat, the complication that we want to treat, will determine the amount of weight loss we want to target for the patient. For example, Ms. Triple A, she had IFG. Uh, pre-diabetes, she had PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome probably, um, she has hard to treat hypertension. Therefore, if she's keen to lose weight, we then need to talk about at least a 10%, if not more, 15%, if we want to talk about diabetes remission uh, in her or prevention of diabetes. And when it comes to hypertension, just to lower the blood pressure, maybe 5%, but to reduce the number of medications. Uh, she was already on four antihypertensive medications. We need to target 10 or 15% of weight loss there. And on and on it goes, depending on the goal uh, of the complication that we want to treat. Now, not all patients want to lose that amount of weight, but we might say we need to lose 15%. Patient says, you know, dark I maybe just want to lose 5%. All right, I just want to control the condition, not to reverse it completely. And we need to come to the consensus with the patient and then decide what the goals of treatment are and hence the weight loss goals. And then we go to this chart, looking at the different types of weight loss interventions and the, uh, and the efficacy. For example, uh, things like lifestyle therapy, intensive calorie diet, and then behavioral modification here, IBT, can emit about three to 10% of weight loss, but the patient needs to lose 15% or more. We then need to look at pharmacotherapy or even bariatric surgery. And then we will discuss the options with the patient. Now we need not start everything, but you know, I often then discuss all the treatment options for the patients to consider, uh, even talking about um, you know, long-term. We need to talk about not just current treatments, but to talk about how we can sustain this weight loss in the long-term uh, for the patient as well. So in, in, in general approach, this is what has been recommended by the Canadian uh, OBC Canada. Um, we need to really ask patients for permission. For example, in, in Ms. Triple A, she didn't come in for the weight. She came in for the hypertension, right? But when weight became an issue, then we need to then introduce that concept to them and sort of ask permission and, and suss out their interests and explore the readiness. And the rest of it we've really talked about, but really agree on the health outcomes with the patient and then help them to get further referrals. And that's our role here. This is the five A's approach. Now, I like to use this chart uh, weight history. In fact, we give them an empty chart like that and ask them to say, you know, what was your starting weight before all this happened? It could be childhood obesity. It could be they've always been heavy their whole life, but then maybe they got married, they started a new job, they went on shift work, new family commitments, they gained the weight. Um, then they've tried things. We've also asked them what they've tried. Oh, this has worked. Why did it work? And why did it didn't? And in so doing, we can also tease out the elements uh, that could predict weight loss and weight maintenance in them and work on that. Now, this is a very nice study done by Professor George Bray, uh, looking at what are the program components, what are the eating behaviors and things like circadian rhythms that, that actually help patients to lose the weight and maintain that weight loss. Example, initial weight, rate of weight loss, use of anti obesity medications are often predictors of, of good weight loss and weight maintenance. So in that sense, we need to then you know, uh, give patients more encouragement and touch points early on. Because if they lose weight well in the beginning, they tend to then lose more weight down the road and keep their weight off. So if the patient's motivated, for example, don't give an appointment in three months, right? We need frequent touch points. It'll be two weeks later, we'll give you a phone call. A month later, you come back to the clinic to visit the nurse. If your practice is really busy, we can use coordinators, nurses, uh, to then give them uh, you know, contact with the patients so that we can say, you know, troubleshoot early and see we need to uh, correct some of the factors or even use new medications and definitely encourage some lifestyle changes there. So the key thing, 
uh, it's not about what diet is good. We often get asked, is the keto diet good? Is intermittent fasting good? But actually it's to look at, you know, adherence actually at the end of the day, whether it's the Atkins, the Zone, the Weight Watchers or the Ornish diet, they could lose weight or even gain weight on therapy. But what's key was the adherence to that particular therapy. So we need to find the motivators or even the barriers to adherence to the weight loss to then motivate the patient and use whatever is safe for them and whatever works for them. So again, we've discussed how when we make patients lose weight, we create this energy gap, right? So in our therapies, we need to then target these um, physiologic adaptations. This reduce satiety and increase hunger. We can use medications like GLP-1 receptor agonins. Bariatric surgery is definitely good with that because it can cause you know, all these changes in gut hormones. And we also have these uh, new analogs, which are appetite suppressive, including satiety and cessation coming up. Different types of diet elements can also help you know, counteract that hunger. Um, and even, you know, increasing uh, energy expenditure through different types of exercises, resistant exercise can help uh, counteract this reduced energy expenditure. And perhaps glucagon receptor agonists have shown promise and even bariatric surgery in counteracting this uh, reduced energy expenditure in response to weight loss. So traditionally, though, we've been taught to use this pyramid method. If lifestyle fails, then you consider pharmacotherapy. If that fails, then you go bariatric surgery. And we can drag on months and months at end. And if we saw those predictors, by the time the patient would have lost steam, the motivation, in fact, they will start blaming themselves for not being successful and we've lost the patient, right? So rather, why don't we, looking at all the data that we have and knowing that, you know, when patients lose weight, it's not just one factor, or when patients gain weight, it's not just one factor. There are many factors that we need to take care of is to then use multimodal approach adjunctive from the outset. And then we've discussed some of the elements. So some of the studies have looked into that. For example, in the scale IBT or intensive behavioral therapy, it showed that patients uh, on placebo and intensive bariatric, uh, behavioral therapy, IBT, can lose about 5% of the weight at the end of one year, but if we add on things like regular height 3.0, we can cause more weight uh, loss in these patients. And people on uh, the medical therapy, like regular height, have a two to two and a half fold to be able to achieve these weight loss targets, including up to 15% of the weight loss. Now, this was done in primary care. So I'd like to introduce you to this online material that you can use. Um, so supportive therapy, along with pharmacotherapy, uh, is very good. And, and our we doctors need not do it. We can train our nurses, our coordinators to do that. And really, if you look at the program, it talks about the different elements, the lifestyle therapy, the behavioral therapy that we need to target alongside with um, pharmacotherapy. We don't target all these things. Often the pharmacotherapy may not work so well, or even bariatric surgery may not work so well, and a high propensity for weight regain. Now, another therapy or another strategy that can be used is to use low calorie diet, first achieving, let's say, about 5% weight loss. And this is in the scale maintenance study. Uh, and then adding either liraglutide and placebo in these patients for about one year. And we saw that in addition to the 6% weight loss with the low calorie and lifestyle therapy, people on liraglutide could lose additional about 6.2% of their weight, about a total maybe 10 to 12% of the weight. And when patient, more uh, participants or patients on the loracotide could then lose more weight uh, after being on the medication. So we call this like a stack therapy or serial or back-to-back -back strategy. We use that in things like intragastric balloon. When the effects of the balloon is wearing out at three, six, or even nine months, we add on the added obesity medication. Or even post very low calorie diet lose a lot of weight, but weight maintenance can be challenging. We'll add on therapies, uh, anti bc medication, post-bariatric surgery. A lot of patients, either uh, some patients, sorry, do not lose adequate weight or even weight regain. That's very common. We then add in pharmacotherapy. And actually, liraglutide has been most studied uh, in this situation and shown to be very effective. So in choosing the type of therapy, we have to go beyond uh, just weight loss. Uh, you know, many of our patients come in with metabolic uh, disorders, fatty liver, pre-diabetes or even diabetes and dyslipidemia and choosing the therapy that can then 
uh, uh, benefit them, and particularly in heart disease as well, is good. So GLP receptor agonist not only improves glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity, it targets that counter-regulatory uh, hormone uh, so effect of weight loss, but also has beneficial cardiovascular uh, effects. Now, in the scale of BC and pre-diabetes study, uh, liraglutide used up to three years has been shown to reduce the new onset of diabetes in up by eighty uh, percent. Uh, sorry, relatively eighty percent compared to people in placebo, and they can even maintain a weight loss of six percent up to three years. Now, a lot of patients with NASH in this lean forty-eight uh, week study, in which liraglutide of only one point eight and not three milligrams was used, you can see that. You know, you can see good histological improvement in NASH, not fibrosis, but in NASH, which is hepatitis. And we can see a good a mean change in uh, the transaminitis as well. So not only do we benefit them in weight loss, but also in other uh, metabolic parameters and bariatric surgery has been shown not to really produce more substantial changes in these, but also sustainable changes uh, with his therapy, and, and, and especially in patients with diabetes. Now, in Singapore, we looked at a cohort of our patients with undergo gastric bypass or sleep. At one year, they lost about 25% of their weight, very good. But in this, you know, quite hardcore patients with diabetes, long duration of diabetes there, we could even see a substantial number of patients attaining diabetes remission using these cutoffs here. And you can see very good HB1C drops of 2 to 2.7%. Uh, uh, very effective uh, glucose lowering effect there, you can see. And not only that, uh, many patients, and more than half patients, could reduce their blood pressure and lipid medication use and sustain good control. So you could kill many birds with one stone with your therapy, hopefully, um, and, and these are the therapies we've suggested. And now if there are some patients who do not qualify for um, bariatric surgery, like our Miss Triple C, she wanted to reverse her diabetes or cause diabetes remission, but her BMI was only 30. So we may potentially consider then things like very low calorie diet and structured lifestyle counseling, as we see in direct study in, done in the UK. Um, they put patients on total knee replacements for anywhere three to five months, slowly introducing food over two to eight weeks and continually supporting their patients to structure uh, support. And this was all done in the GP or primary care setting. And they found that in patients who are able to stick to the program and guided by the community dietitians and nurses were able to maintain a lot of their weight most of their weight at two years, with 11% able to achieve more than 15 kgs of weight loss and 36% able to achieve and sustain diabetes remission. Now, again, obesity is a chronic disease. We've talked about it will relapse. So our interventions should be uh, used as the chronic disease model uh, in mind to be sustainable so that we can minimize or prevent that weight regain. All right, so it's not meant to be for three to six months. Even if you can't have all the elements, at least most of the elements should be this, should be adhered to, including anti-VC medications. Now, this is semaglutide 2.4, which is improved, has been approved for weight, uh, diabetes, uh, weight loss, sorry, obesity treatment in the US and in Europe. Uh, we have one milligram in, in many parts of Asia approved for uh, diabetes treatment. But the step five study looked at the treatments up to two years in patients who maintain on the therapy. They can maintain this weight loss of up to 16% on those that stick to the treatment with 83% uh, of patients able to maintain at least 5% of the weight loss. So while patients are on the therapy, they can maintain that weight loss um, and, and definitely much better than uh, not being on medication. And bariatric surgery, as we talked about, has been shown to be the one therapy that's most sustainable because it's permanent in most of the patients with people being able to maintain 20 to 25% of the weight loss over 20, 20 years and uh, things like gastric bypass therapy there. Now, the last concept that I want to use uh, to introduce to you is really matching the treatment to the patient profile and phenotypes. And in this pragmatic trial in obesity clinic done in Mayo Clinic in the US, they look at the, they studied the patient and then use these different elements to classify them into four obesity phenotypes, whether it's normal association, hedonic eating, so patients have cravings due to emotional eating, 
uh, not because they're hungry per se, uh, people who have abnormal satiety, the hungry gut, and people who have slow metabolism. Uh, using the concepts of obesity pathophysiology that we've previously discussed in the first talk, and then using the different types of uh, medications uh, in this stuff. For example, in hungry brain, um, they use uh, fentramine, topiramate, or even locasserin. In people with cravings, uh, hedonic eating, they use contrave or bupropyronaltraxone. And in the hungry gut, they use liraglutide. In people with slow burn, they use fentramine and increased resistance, uh, uh, resistance exercise. And they've shown that people who are phenotype guided, you know, will lose more weight, 16% uh, versus 9% who are not guided. And the proportion of people who lost more than 10% uh, are much greater in phenotype patients than non-phenotype patients. Now, obviously, some of the modalities that they use here, we don't have in our clinics. Uh, but we can use some elements, the questionnaires on the eating behavior. As I talked about, you, you ask them about the lifestyle factors, and then you set to tailor their therapy or even their past uh, attempts. We can use that to design, you know, what kind of medications or treatments work best for them. But lastly, I want to end up by introducing you uh, to this algorithm that was in the consensus uh, for the South, uh, for consensus to obesity care in South and Southeast Asia, uh, of which uh, Dr. Tran Kong Nam was a part of at the faculty. And, and we come up with this practical uh, approach here that touched about the elements that I've discussed, basically establishing uh, patient with obesity. Now, sometimes patients don't come to you uh, saying I have obesity or I have a heavy weight. They come to us with obesity-related complications, like our miss triple A at the beginning. And then we assess them further, looking at the drivers uh, of weight loss, including the barriers and also uh, the impact of obesity, which has not been presented yet, stage them, and then come up with uh, you know, individualized treatment guides or weight loss goals, and then designing the therapy and always going the reassessment again and again. And at the background, we need to um, always be mindful of uh, supporting the patient, of the impact of weight bias and stigma in ourselves and also in patients. Uh, and with that, I'll introduce uh, you to this algorithm and also to the reference over here. And I will end my talk here and thank you for your attention and we'll be able to take questions uh, at the end of our whole entire session here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kongwangwei, for a very uh, interesting uh, talk. So uh, we uh, move uh, to the next.